Okay, recording has started. Let's uh, pray and get into uh, the chapters for today. Uh, who would like to lead us in prayer? Okay, Kung, would you please be able to lead us? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for um, uh, this time to uh, learn about you and always God. Um, Lord, as we uh, study your word, thank you so much God, for uh, for uh, imparting to us what you have to say and uh, revealing to us your heart and uh, help us Lord to live um, like the way you want us to live and that um, we would do everything to glorify you God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kung. Uh, let's now get into the passages. We were at First Peter chapter three, and uh, we saw the instructions of submission to within the family setting. Uh, there was some instruction for the wife, and then some instruction for the husband, godly husband. Now. Let's move on to the next verse here. We will read uh, from verse 8. And we could probably read. Okay, uh, let's read till verse 12. Verse 8 to verse 12. Could somebody go ahead and read it? Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or be following for resolving, reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you are called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love, right, and see good ways, let him keep his tongue from evil, and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Asha. Um, uh, as we look at this passage, we, we know that there have been different um, different instructions to have the right attitude even under persecution and difficult times. So there was uh, this whole thing about submitting to authorities, submitting to uh, the masters, and submitting uh, in this case, you know, the wife to the husband, and now coming to the brotherhood or the community of God's people, there is this encouragement to, in a sense, though the word submit is not used here, in a sense, it's about caring for one another. It's about loving one another and living in unity. And uh, um, Peter urges the believers to be of one mind. So what is one mind? Is one mind uh, imposing one ideology on everyone such that people don't have their own personal opinions or what is one mind should all the the whole congregation be forced to say the same thing do the same thing Not then how, so it, okay then what would that mean for us it means basically uh unity of heart oneness of mind um respecting everyone's view and then everyone intentionally coming to um a point that um it's pleasing to god and also goes along with everyone agreed upon one mind basically unity of mind that's it basically yes thank you so much uh say and uh kennedy sh shares one accord of me says mind submitted to god and value each other's opinion yes so ultimately it's about what god wants what the word of god says 
for example, if we recall the Acts 15 uh, Council, people may have had their own opinions. Um, but once they made the decision, there is a statement in that passage. It says that whatever they, they decided, um, you know, it, it was OK with the Holy Spirit. Or the Holy Spirit was pleased with their decision. So ultimately, what was it that was decided and chosen? What was pleasing to God? And in the same way, we can all have different opinions. We can all have um, you know, uh, different uh, directions in our thought process. But at the end of the day, there is a oneness, which is us, all of us submitting to what God wants at the end of the day. right? And thereby, maybe uh, 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 an opinion comes from one of our teammates or one of the uh, people in our church. And that is well-pleasing to the Holy Spirit. Right in those moments, okay, this is the right thing for us to do. So we we're all willing to submit to that and be of one accord and say, okay, let's go with this because this is what is God's will uh, in these moments. So this is the right decision to be made. So this is a tough thing. Unity is always a tough thing, uh, but one needs to um, one needs to know that uh, there is a blessing that comes with it. So as you read that passage there, he says, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender hearted, be courteous, uh, beautiful uh, instructions for community living. And then he goes on to say, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. So in contrast, uh, people could be taking revenge on each other if anything goes wrong. He says, live with love and don't ever take revenge. Okay, or don't uh, don't engage in a tit for tat kind of an attitude with believers. But on the contrary, he says blessing. Just the way Jesus taught us, he said, you know, uh, people may wrong you. If if somebody wrongs you, you still be kind to that person. You know, if they slap you one cheek, show the other cheek. So the essence of that is uh, to be kind, basically, to people. On the contrary, he says blessing. Even those who have hurt us, uh, being ready to bless them. So what is going to be the outcome when we have such an attitude? He goes on to say, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So God is not um, you know, telling us to do things without an outcome. And that outcome is a definite blessing so when we walk with the lord in in a in a uh, manner of maintaining unity and uh, letting go like even if somebody has hurt us we choose to bless them then what what does it say here we are going to inherit a blessing we are going to inherit a blessing okay so that's um, the beauty of that now moving ahead he talks about uh, he points out, you know, uh, another promise here. So he says, he, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So this is just in connection with what we have discussed now, that we must do good and uh, we must keep our tongue from evil. We don't take revenge. Um, uh, and when we do that, God is somebody who will um, respond to us because we, we are acting in righteousness. So that's uh, the meaning of the passage that we just read. Now, let's go ahead uh, and read from verse 13. Yeah, we could read till uh, okay. We uh, we could read till verse eighteen, and then we'll do the next section. Shall I read, ma'am? Yes, Sammi. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, and nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, 
those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Abni. So here in this passage, we um, see that the believers are being encouraged to endure suffering and persecution. So that's why he states things like, um, who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? So once you become followers of Jesus, you're followers of what is good, and persecution can rise up against us. But then there is a reminder, when we suffer for the sake of righteousness, we are blessed. Okay, So even in that suffering, God is a God who reminds us that, you know, uh, in his eyes, we have not, you know, we, we haven't fallen, that we are still blessed in his eyes and that uh, we must be strong in those moments of persecution. So now he continues in this context when there is opposition and there is persecution. He also says that we should have uh, uh, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That is to say that honor God in your hearts. So when we honor God, what do we do? We've seen earlier when we honor someone, we serve them, right? We serve them. We live for, we live for them. We bless them. So sanctify the Lord your Lord, your God in your heart says, honor God and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks. So obviously, when we are living in a context where uh, people don't believe in Jesus and we do, and they are speaking ill against us, there can be times when they ask us, okay, tell me, why do you believe this? Or what did Jesus do for you? Or uh, what is uh, what will happen if we die? So people have questions. So he says... Be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. So uh, we honor God, we serve God, but we also are convicted about the things that we believe in and we are able to share right? Uh, what we know, the truth of the word of God and uh, in this manner uh, be able to reach out and impact others. Then he goes on. He uh, talks about facing difficulties for the sake of Christ. And he says, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So when persecution happens, be encouraged because you're not being persecuted because you are wrong, but you're being persecuted because you follow Jesus. And remember, Jesus also said that if this has happened to him, why wouldn't it happen to the people who follow him? And uh, I had pointed out earlier that Peter brings up the example of Jesus himself and uses that to encourage the believer. So in verse 18, he says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit. So a reminder that this is not unique to us as believers. Instead, Christ Jesus has suffered for us. And uh, so we have to draw from his life and his example. So this is a preparation for the believers, preparing them mentally for what is to come. Now let's go ahead to the next section. We'll read from verse 19 till yeah, till verse 22. Can somebody go ahead and read this, please? Well, then also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an uh, antitype which now saves us baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience to 
God, through the, res through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has also gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Okay, so here there is a sl slightly difficult section uh, because there is a mention of certain events that took place after the Lord Jesus died and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and he went to Hades. So these events we, we do see. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, we see um, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, a little more to add to this. And then this same theme or about these spirits, certain spirits and fallen angels that we're going to talk about, it will be repeated in the book of Jude as well. Okay, So uh, I'm just giving you, uh, I'm just saying it now so that you recall when we are doing the book of Jude. So here he says, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient. So uh, in the Christian circles, there is, a, there is a question about who are these spirits who have been in prison. So there are some spirits that have been imprisoned okay, and are waiting for the day of judgment. So who are these spirits? He connects these spirits to Noah. And Noah's times. So he goes on to say, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. So our understanding is that what exactly happened was uh, in, in Genesis 6, we, we have a description of how um, the sons of God, they... Um, you know, they had they had progeny or descendants with the daughters of uh, daughters of man. And that was something uh, which God was not happy about. Because what did these angels, I mean, we, we understand that they are angels. Okay? So angels, sons of God, because this terminology is used in the book of Job to describe angels also. Uh, and so... We know that these are angels, and when we talk about fallen angels who are inhabiting the earth, we also use another term for them, that is disembodied spirits, or they are actually demons. So demons um, uh, having descendants with human beings was something that God was very unhappy about. And after this incident is when God told Noah that he needs to build an ark because this earth is going to be destroyed. There was What had happened was there, there, uh, the earth would have had um, a mixed race as well, you know, post this point. But God did not want that. And we see how God says that, you know, he was so unhappy uh, with mankind. So Noah and his family, so the eight of them over there uh, are uh, the family of Noah. They went into the ark and they were saved. So here, with the example of Noah, what we are being told is that these people were saved. These people were saved in a period of calamity. So even today for us, as the world, we know the earth is corrupted with sin. And without Jesus, we too will perish. So similar to perishing in the flood. But we being in the ark like Noah is simply us being saved and experiencing salvation. So salvation is something that saves us. But here he also uses a term such as uh, or, or phrase such as was saved through water. And thankfully, he interprets that himself and says there is also an antitype which now saves us baptism. So when he talks about water, he somehow connects that to baptism and says that uh, baptism is a picture of us being saved. But notice 
he clarifies something very important in that statement he says not the removal of filth of the flesh meaning baptism cannot save us or baptism is not a prerequisite to um uh, uh, for someone to receive salvation so baptism can baptism clean us of the sins in uh, that we have no he makes it very clear not the removal of filth of the flesh because baptism in itself cannot do that baptism is just an outward expression of our faith so it's a proclamation of our faith but then he says but the answer of a of a good conscience toward god so when we study about baptism we know that even the lord jesus who did not need to be baptized he was baptized in water by john the baptist but what statement did jesus make he said so that all obedience might be fulfilled that is why jesus was baptized not because he had sin in his life or that he needed to repent no he actually didn't but so that all obedience might be fulfilled and similarly over here what is being said is a good conscience toward god so when you and i are baptized what happens we are being obedient every believer is being obedient to god through baptism and uh, that requirement which you know jesus has um, asked of which is baptism to profess our faith we take part in it so he's the uh, author here is talking about baptism which um, is a symbol of of us uh, being in christ jesus and then he says through the resurrection of jesus christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of god angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him so many things here but we are not going to go into the depths of it it talks about jesus's current position where is his current position it's in heaven he's now ascended so uh, uh, technically he is up in heaven and the way book of hebrews describes him as deity as the one whom um, angels worship so he is in that place of authority and every other authority and power is subject to him so let's move ahead now to uh first peter chapter 4 any thoughts any questions about what we have discussed so far yes pastor um, i was just going to also um point out something that the preaching not necessarily preaching for salvation but basically the is declaration am i right to say that like proclaiming what he has already accomplished on the cross not necessarily preaching to the spirits to be converted am i correct to say that yes yes absolutely and uh, that's a very crucial point which i missed thank you for bringing that up preaching is not evangelism but preaching is declaration in this instance okay thank you thank you pastor thank you yeah thank you for that uh yes now let's go to first peter chapter 4 Okay, let's read uh, from. Okay, let's read the first six verses. First six verses. It reads, "Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh." For the lust of men, but for the will of God, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, loss, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard of to this, to this, they think it strange that you do not run with them. in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead for this reason 
the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Amen. Thank you, Say. So as we come to um, the next section here, what we're noticing is that suffering okay so there is a, a couple of verses here that talk about suffering and the fact that when one has suffered his flesh has ceased from sin okay and that leads to this person being able to live for the will of god and no longer for the lust of men so the way we understand this is some some of us or people in general when they go through persecution there is an advantage because you see they have experienced such lows that their flesh uh, uh, ha has been subjected to uh, pain and they have learned how to overcome and even push through you know, those seasons of pain so he's saying that because of this kind of self-control that one develops during periods of persecution, uh, they have a stronger ability to follow after God. Now, we shouldn't take this and make a doctrine out of it and say that, oh, only if you have suffered for Jesus, then you can have, you know, a strong uh, walk with the Lord. Uh, only then you can be a testimony for God. That's not what, you know, this, this is actually leading to. But he is saying that when people suffer to follow Jesus, uh, they end up being very passionate for God. Okay, So it does happen. Uh, and, and that's what he's stating, that when somebody has suffered, uh, the flesh has ceased from sin. So they've already learned how to be overcomers because they've come through a season of persecution. Now, he goes on to emphasizing the fact that now that we are born again believers we should have a different life compared to the people around us so then he lists out many things which shouldn't be a part of a christian's life he says walking in lewdness lusts drunkenness revelries drinking parties abominable uh, idolatry now, these are all things uh, that we shouldn't be participating in because we have no, no association with these things and when people see us they should be able to notice that we are uh, different from them, that we don't participate in these things. And they might even find it strange uh, that we, we are not part of these things. He uses a term uh, such as flood of dissipation. Flood of dissipation is wastefulness, you know, a wasteful way of living uh, that people who are not in Christ would be okay with. And when this happens, um, People, you know, they may speak evil of you or, or you know, they may find you strange, uh, but, but all that's fine. Like we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, be too worried about it because it's meant to happen, isn't it? So uh, let our lives be different from the unbelievers. And then he also reminds us that there is a God who will judge us. He will judge us for the works that we have done. Now, this is not to say that, our salvation is dependent on the works, but our works are important because they profess our faith in God. So to have a godly living is very much a part of living out that life of salvation which Christ has given us. And again here, there is this uh, comment that the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. So people ask the question, what is the point uh, of preaching the gospel to the dead? Because we already know that it is for man to die once, Hebrews 9, I think 27, after which is judgment. So if there's only one lifetime, how does preaching after death help? So we have to understand it in the context of what is being said here. Preaching to the dead here is, again, the time when Jesus, after his death went down to this place called Hades, right? So Hades at that point had uh, 
uh, sections. And one of the sections was known as Abraham's bosom. And Abraham's bosom was the place where all the dead righteous, those who believed in God, those who uh, uh, walked with the Lord, all those people were over in that place known as Abraham's bosom. And it was there that he went. So these were all dead people. There he went. Again, this term preach is not evangelism. To declare that the work of redemption is now underway, that you know, it, it is going to be through and uh, that the equation is going to change now. So basically, it was a declaration which he made to these dead people in Abraham's bosom. And our, or some people also call this section as paradise. So once Jesus died, he took the keys of hell and he ascended uh, up into heaven, paradise or Abraham's bosom no longer exists. The reason is when Paul writes, he says to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So directly we go to heaven, right? When we now, any believer dies, what happens? We directly go into the presence of God. There is no more concept of going to paradise or going to Abraham's bosom. Uh, and, and when Jesus did this, he was actually fulfilling some of the uh, promises which had been spoken of in the book of Isaiah. If you recall, uh, in Isaiah 61, it says, proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound. So uh, one meaning is this, that those who were in a bound state in paradise, they were set free. Now they had the, um, uh, you know, the release to go up to heaven. So that is the understanding. Uh, now we can move on to the next section, verse 7 to verse 11. Uh, any thoughts or questions regarding preaching to the dead? OK, uh, Kennedy has a note here. He says, but the dead are conscious of nothing. Kindly clarify. OK. Just go back to that section. Um, can we? Can you explain? The dead are conscious of nothing. I didn't quite get what. Uh, okay, uh, he wants to take it up later. All right, fine then. Let's uh, let's move on. We read till six, so let's start from seven. Seven to eleven, please. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable, be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift. Minister it to one another as good steward of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the author of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supports. And in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom belong the glory of the dominion of Anna. Thank you, Abhinash. Um, we notice here that in the last days, there Certain, certain important things have been emphasized for the believer uh, to practice. So firstly, he says, be serious and watchful in your prayers. The end of all things is at hand. So again, for the early church, uh, they believed that the Lord Jesus would come back and they had no idea of the timelines. Okay? Maybe uh, some of them um, knew they could estimate and, and see that 
the second coming of the Lord Jesus would take a while longer. But then in general, what they believed was the return of the Lord is imminent and it could happen anytime. And that's the way they lived. And when you study books such as Thessalonians, you understand that the early church believers, they, they were encouraged to live as if Christ can return any moment in our lifetime. So we have to be ready. And that is why even Peter says, but the end of all things is at hand. We are living in the last of the last days, but the last days began once the Lord Jesus ascended. And they were consciously living their lives ready for the return of Christ. So it's a challenge for us today. If the first century church believers were living as if Jesus can come any moment, we who are right now in the last days, you know, what is our attitude? What is our attitude? Are we still given to the fact that you know we are uh, analyzing and uh, estimating and saying, ah, it's okay, it'll take some more time. And we can we still have time to do whatever we want to do. But that wasn't the way they lived. So it's really a challenge to us. And then he goes on to say, be serious, watchful in your prayers. So what, what are the important things one needs to do in the last days? To be alert, right? Yes, I, we have to fulfill our God's calling on our lives. Uh, we have to do everything God has called us to do. Uh, be ready. Christ can come anytime. So be serious or be alert. Watchful in your prayers. So a thriving prayer life is very key for the believers in the last days. Okay. So personal prayer life, a corporate prayer life, because it helps us stay alert. And, you know, against the schemes, the plots of the devil, we, we can even overcome those things. So Prayer is very, very important. Uh, and prayer is a state of us anticipating. You know, when we are in prayer, it's like we are preparing ourselves uh, for the bridegroom. So that is the posture, right? Prayer gives us that posture. So prayer is very important. Be alert, be prayerful. What are the other important things for the last days? He recommends love, fervent love for one another. And then he says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So Hosp hospitality moves from that place of, emerges from the place of love, right? When we love one another, we will care for one another. We will provide one another's needs, be kind to one another. And then the next important thing is, he says, use your gifts and abilities. Don't, you know, put it on the shelf. But according to what each one has received from God, each one has received a gift. For what sake? For it to be used. Not to be kept, but to be used. So he says, each one has a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So in the last days, all of us as believers, as saints, we should be engaging ourselves in serving the kingdom of God. There's nothing big or small. What gift we have received, according to the grace of God, put it into practice. Be a blessing to somebody. Uh, he talks about the people who speak as oracles of God or as if, you know, what uh, God is speaking. What is it that God wants to say? So those who speak should be a voice of God being, releasing what God wants to say. Anyone who is ministering should do that with the ability that God gives that person. And in all these things, may God be glorified. So what are some of the things we understood? He asked us to be alert. He asked us to be prayerful. He asked us to um, be grounded in love and serve one another. He also asked us to use our abilities to serve God and serve each other. And in all these things, our God is glorified. Uh, let's now read the passage from uh, verse 12. Two verse 16. Yeah, do so not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to ask him. As though something strange were happening to you, that rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad in his glory and reward. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. There is a spirit of Glory, but God rests on you. 
I let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evil doer or as a murderer. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that day. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, So as he spoke of the last days, the next thing that he wants to remind the believer is endurance. There will be persecution, but in the midst of persecution, uh, be strong. And he is uh, wanting to emphasize a mindset, right? A mindset where uh, he says, this life is temporal. Eternally, we are going to be blessed. We are going to receive rewards from God. So he says, you be glad because his glory and when his glory is revealed you may also be glad with exceeding joy so during persecution have an eternal mindset we are going to um, receive uh, god's blessings later on and once again he says that persecution can happen and we may suffer but make sure that you don't suffer for doing the wrong thing because uh you know, sometimes it's just easy to get into trouble and call it persecution. But then the problem may have happened because of our carelessness. And he's encouraging the believers not, you know, to, to get into that. So he says, you have a righteous life. And after walking righteously before God, if you suffer, then don't worry. You, you be strong because God is there for you and God will uh, reveal his glory right at the, at the end of the age uh, but if you have made a mistake and you're suffering then uh, that that shouldn't be called as persecution so now we can read the next set of scriptures here from verse 17 please and uh, maybe all the way through 17 to 19 for the time has come for judgment to begin by the house of god and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinners be? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to in doing good as to a faithful will. Yeah, thank you, Abhinash. So this last section where he says, "For uh, the time has come for judgment. So judgment here, because we are talking about persecution, it is in that context. So he's saying the time has come for the fiery trials to take place. Okay, And these trials will take place here among the believers. And that's why he says the house of God, judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So he says something like if we go through these kind of trials and we have God in our lives, we are still able to bear it. We are still able to come out victorious. But think about those who don't have God in their lives, meaning the entire world. What will become of them uh, when uh, trials and difficulties come their way? Uh, and then he goes on to say, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. So basically, dependence on God, dependence on the salvation of God, Right, is what is very important. And that is what strengthens us even through periods of trial. Okay, so we are now through with uh, chapter four. We will move ahead to chapter five. Let's see you know, how far we complete. So I'm thinking if we can cover a substantial amount today, then I'll probably do one. Um, session record one hour of session if required right uh, uh, for the remaining 
portions and then uh, we we can just i just request the team to put it up for you so we don't really have to attend the class next week so there'll just be an additional hour of lecture that you can listen to anytime uh, so for now let's go to first peter chapter 5 First Peter yeah. chapter five. Oh, go ahead. go ahead. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are anger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking somehow, someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little, a, a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Shall I continue, ma'am? Uh, yes, sister, please. You can uh, um, finish the passage. Yeah. Uh, by Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sister, for reading the entire passage there. Uh, we have only two minutes left. So what we could do is we could go in for a break. Uh, let's come back. Uh, we could come back at, um, at, at 10 should be fine. Let's come back at 10 a.m. And then we will go over First Peter chapter 5. Thank you. <laughs> 